In 2006, when Convergence Culture came out, you were very dismissive of what you called the black box theory, this idea, almost an axiom, particularly in the UK, that we would end up with some kind of convergent technology which did everything. Do you still stand by that today? Well, I, uh, yes and no. I mean, I have to say the Apple products have convinced me that we can integrate more media functions more seamlessly into a single black box than I would have imagined at the time that I wrote that book. That I think, and partially that's because we've learned to design new kinds of apps, we've figured out what kinds of apps work, we've taught people how to use them, use interfaces. That said, I don't think we're, we're, we're any of us are ready to give up any of our other black boxes, right? Mm -hmm. That even if I have an iPad or an uh, iPhone, which I carry with me, I still prefer to watch my television on a big screen TV. I still prefer the option of using DVDs to watch media. I think we are very much interested in having multiple media with multiple functions that can be used in intersection with each other in a varied way. And that's part of the ways we're customizing our media environments. And I don't see that going away anytime soon, even if we are closer to that magic black box than I would have predicted when I wrote the book. So is this technology push or technology pull? Is this, are Apple responding to what consumers want and need, or are they the new Microsoft, the new kind of Google, the new sort of... Um, well, in an, ideal, in an ideal world, there is a dialogue between our uses and the technologies that have provided us, both in the sense that we are often race ahead of the technology and force them to do things they weren't designed to do. And that's a good anticipator of what they will do eventually. We also reject those technologies that don't work the way we want them. And so you can try to lead us to water, but you can't make us drink. You know, we're continually re refusing what are presented as advances of technologies that aren't in our interest. That said, I think that a certain Apple company uh, is more seductive than ideal in its will, and, and we are in danger often with the Apple products of giving up the freedom to participate in favor of well-curated, well-designed, beautifully interfaced, magical technologies. And I think that's a challenge we face right now. That one of the biggest face challenges we face is the curation may displace a much more open participatory platform if we allow it. And I think those of us who want to hold on to a participatory culture have to raise the alarm when Apple makes it far too easy to filter out massive amounts of amateur produced content and not support them on the tool sets that we're being given. Okay. It's the second time you've used the word creation there, which is a uh, curation there, which is interesting. How are you defining curation in this kind of context? Well, well there, I'm, I guess I'm using curation in two ways. First of all, I'm using the idea, uh, and at a grassroots level, what's going on is we are scanning the media environment constantly, performing what I would call acts of appraisal, trying to determine what media content is valuable and useful to us, and passing it along to our friends. And this is what I'm calling in the book I'm writing right now, spreadable media. That is, spreadable media is about grassroots circulation and curation, the selection and passing on of media and often reframed with our own agendas, our own messages, and so forth, which I think is partially shaping the media landscape we live in today. Apple uses the word curation uh, to refer to what we might in other contexts call censorship. Right? Apple applies a set of standards to determine what's appropriate for an Apple technology to use. It starts by disallowing uh, Flash, which is still the preferred tool for large numbers of grassroots media producers. So you have trouble using an Apple product uh, accessing much of what was produced by amateur media makers around the world. And that's a problem. But add to it, Apple is filtering out things on the stand, you know, on both technical standards, moral standards, uh, and the result is that lots of material that we routinely could expect to have access to on the web has been removed in the name of Apple providing better service, quote unquote, to its user base. And so I see those almost as the opposite ends of the spectrum. Even though Apple is using the same word curation, it's really not describing the kind of active selectivity at the grassroots level that I think is the heart of a spreadable media culture. And that tension is the kind of prime focus of where new media is now? I think that's, a new, that's part of the new battle that yeah. we're fighting right now. I think, you know, what I'm trying to do, is I've done much of my career focused on participation and production, which are part of a participatory culture world. I'm now sort of asking the question, what do we learn if we focus on circulation and selection uh, in this new media environment? How has that changed? 
and the story, book will open with the story of Susan Boyle, uh, your, okay. you know, which I think is a really rich example. Because American Idol, uh, the week that Susan Boyle hit in the United States, American Idol drew 40 million viewers to American network television. And Susan Boyle was seen by roughly 200 million viewers via YouTube and other video sharing sites. So while she was on television in the UK, she was not legally on television in the United States until significantly later. Pirated versions were filtering through YouTube, being passed along at an astonishing rate by large numbers of people, and at a rate that drew more attention than the top-rated show on American television during the same time period. So that raises a lot of interesting questions about how does media spread when it reaches that scale, what is, what is its actual impact. The interesting thing is that the producers both here and the U.S. were unable to monetize mm. that success during that time period. That the, it was too, the companies weren't nimble enough to get Britain's Got Talent on the air in the United States on cable or broadcast. They couldn't cut a deal in time with iTunes or Hulu. They really, the only place you watched Susan Boyle was via the Pirates. Mm. And so that also raises a question about our media ecology. At a time when the flow of media across national borders is more rapid and more intense than ever before, and it's being pulled by consumers, media companies have failed to keep up with the pirates. And so in that context, I think people turn to piracy not as a result of the moral failure of consumers, but the market failure of companies. Now, so what we're trying to do is understand how that grassroots circulation is being courted by political groups, by news organizations, by independent media makers, by global media makers, to try to diversify what material we have access to. And then we're seeing people churn up older media forms that they suddenly find investments in and demonstrate that they still have life and relevance in contemporary culture. So at the heart, we're trying to talk about how media spreads. And we're doing so as a critique of the viral media theory that sort of is the dominant way we talk about such matters. Viral media is, I call it the smallpox infected blanket theory of media transmission because it's basically the idea that we get infected by media and we become its unknowing host and pass it irrationally on to our friends and family. Whereas we think that there's a whole series of very conscious choices around meaning and community and reciprocity that shape what media gets passed along, how it gets passed along, how it gets framed as it gets passed along. And that's part of what we're trying to explain in this new book project. So people are going out there and getting deliberately infected. Is or, well, I, I see, I would avoid the infection model altogether, right? Some media makes me sick, but by and <laughs> large, I think that we choose media that, makes, that encourages our own well-being at least as we see it, and that we pass along media to other people that we care about because we think it's an ideal gift that reflects something about ourselves, something about the world, or something about our relationship to the other person, that it's a meaning-driven activity with a great deal of human agency behind it.